Welcome to Emerging Franchise Brands, the podcast that introduces you to the visionary founders of America's fastest growing franchise opportunities. We'll also hear from industry pros as they share insights on what it really takes to achieve the elusive milestone of 100 plus locations. I am your host, Frank Fumi, founder of i9 Sports, and my 20 year journey from inception to acquisition has given me a unique perspective on how to succeed in franchising. Join me as we welcome today's guest. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Emerging Franchise Brands podcast. We have a very special guest today. We have Mike Neal, who's from MVP Results, an elite partner of Predictive Index. And I've got to tell you that Predictive Index was probably the most powerful tool my company ever used to grow my business. I'm really excited to have Mike on the show. Mike, welcome. Thanks, Frank. It's an honor to be here. Looking well, forward to this. Yes, I'm looking forward to it too. So you and I have known each other for a little over 10 years now. Yeah, that first meeting uh, still goes down in legend, actually. <laughs> it does go down in legend. So for those of you that don't know of Predictive Index, it is an assessment tool like no other. So before we get into how we first met and that legendary opening comment that you made to me, uh, let's start by sharing with the audience what Predictive Index is and how it benefits our uh, our franchisors and businesses like. Sure, yeah. I mean, Predictive Index is basically it's a suite of tools, uh, the one we're going to talk about is the predictive index behavioral assessment, but everyone calls it PI, much to a yes. PI's annoyance at the time. So the behavioral assessment is a heavily researched and very valid tool. It helps us understand what makes people tick. It literally just helps us understand this is who you are. This is how you like to work. This is what motivates you. This is what doesn't motivate you. And it helps us look under the hood of someone. And for me, it was such a huge aha moment. Um, without wanting to jump ahead too far, I'm all about data, data, and data, and data. Mm -hmm. So my, my team will tell you that I drive them insane. I'm a huge fan of Deming, and I quote him all the time to people. So one of my favorite ones is, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. And, and as a business owner, the aha moment I had around PI was I had data on everything. I had data on my sales. I had data on my financials. I had data on everything other than the most critical part of my business. People. Exactly. Mm. And, you know, once again, it's a, it's a very old saying, but all business problems are people problems. But nine times out of ten, they are. And so for franchisors and for franchisees, it's about people. You can have the greatest processes in the world. You don't have to create people carrying them out. It really doesn't matter. So the predictive index behavioral assessment, very simple tool, takes about six minutes. Take it online, take it on your computer, take it on your iPhone, whatever. Available in over 70 languages across the globe because we truly are a global company. And it measures four basic drives. Okay. Measures dominance, which is that drive to assert yourself on other people on that you know how decisive you are how confident a person you are in taking things on and everyone has an amount of each of these drives mm -hmm. you know some people have a small amount of dominance so they're very collaborative great team players and others such as maybe you and i frank have <laughs> a lot of dominance and we want to leave our thumbprint on things and take control of the situations but understanding that helps us understand where people fit but also how we can work together better right and then we also measure what we call extroversion, which is that need for social interaction, that comfort level with interpersonal interactions. You know, do I like to talk everything out or am I actually happier being left alone to, to think things through? And then we also measure patience, which is that drive for change and consistency. And some of us have very little of that drive, so we're happy with lots of variety and other people prefer things to be the same day in, day out. And then the fourth drive we measure is formality, which is that need for rules and structure. Am I someone who doesn't have much need for rules and structure? Or do I like to have process, process and process? So by understanding that really helps us understand what makes someone tick and then what behaviours we can expect to see from, from at work, which is why it's called the predictive index. We literally can predict how someone will show up at work. Right. And I think what's interesting is, though, share with the audience too, how, you mentioned it takes six minutes, but how many questions is it two? 
Okay. I know, it, it freaks people out. It does. It is basically a stimulus response instrument. So without diving into the science side, because the IO psychologists up at predicting in its corporate would, would throw a fit if I tried to. <laughs> but basically, it's asking you two questions, and it's asking you to check some words. So, you know, I see the word competitive, and I check that because I'm highly competitive. And my, my wife will not let me play board games with children because you know, it gets embarrassing, you know, I have to win. You know, so I check the word competitive. <laughs> and that actually relates to the dominance factor. So there's a, a list of words, 86 words. You check those that you think apply to you. You don't check those that you don't think apply to you. Or you even know what the word means. Well, there is that as well. But that's another reason why we have it in 70 different languages. So, you, okay. you know, we encourage people to take it in their native tongue. And from that, the magic happens. Um, but yeah, on the, on the surface, it's a very simple tool. But it's backed up with, gosh, nearly 70 years worth of hard science. It's huge and mount 350 plus validity studies out there around this so it is a, it is a scientifically valid tool that you can use the assessment industry has gone crazy over the last few years and you know you can go on facebook and see what kind of disney princess you smell like and you know <laughs> what, what, what kind of donut am i and uh, you know all, all these other crazy things and they're fun don't get me right. wrong but the predictive index is is a, a business tool you know, it is, it is a legally and scientifically valid tool you can use to hire people. So on the surface, it seems very easy. Well, two yeah, questions. Right. But the data it gives you is huge. And that's really, you know, being the data geek that I am, that, that's why I fell in love with mm-hmm. it. Because, so as I say, I've got data on everything other than the, the critical things. There's a, there's a lovely quote from one of Predictive Index's customers, um, a, a wonderful video. And the CEO of this organisation says... We have hundreds of millions of dollars worth of inventory sitting in our warehouses, but our most important asset walks out the door at five o'clock each day. Mm. What, why predictive index made such a huge difference in the growth of my company is that a couple things. One, I realized when I used to interview people and I didn't have this tool looking back, I think that I ended up hiring people that a, I liked a lot and B, I would hire people that had a lot of charisma. And then after I hired them, I realized they were just on their best behavior. Getting that dive beneath the surface, getting that data is huge. Because, yeah, we all have biases. You know, I'm I'm the same. I remember hiring a a, a marketing director for an organization I was running years back, you know, and he walked in and I I just really liked the guy, you know. He liked golden retrievers. I had a golden retriever. He liked soccer. You know, we we basically talked about soccer for about two hours and, and... Really liked the guy. Hired him and he was a disaster. You know, 90 days later, I'm looking at him thinking, why did I do that? But we all tend to do that. You know, we like people who are like us. That's human nature. We're going to do that. But the beauty of the predictive index, it tells us who the person really is, not the person who showed up at the interview on his best behavior. Which everybody that shows up on an interview, I I think the line is, this is as good as it's ever going to get on the interview, right? Exactly. And... Also, and this is particularly important for franchisors as they grow their organisation, but really any business, do you actually want to hire more of you? Because that might not be what you need, you know. And, and so, yeah, our tendency is I'm going to hire people I like or people who are very charismatic, but that may not be what I need for a bookkeeper. I probably don't want someone like me to be a bookkeeper, to be brutally honest. You know, I want someone who's going to be detail orientated and who's right. happy heads down doing that work. Tell us what what does predictive index not do? Lots of things. It doesn't measure skills. It doesn't measure knowledge. It doesn't measure experience. It's a conversation I have quite often with, 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 with clients out there. It's great to understand what motivates someone and makes them tick. But knowledge and experience is important as well. And certainly skills, uh, a really good example, we work with an awful lot of healthcare companies. Now, you can't be a nurse if you don't have the necessary qualifications. You may have the perfect behavioural for it and the cognitive ability to do it, but you've got to have those qualifications. So, yeah, we don't measure skills, knowledge and experience. But in many ways, that's what the resume is for. And we measure stuff that isn't shown on the resume. The resume will tell me you have a degree from XYZ College. If I, if I can quote you, if, I, if I've got this quote right, I think you used to say, a resume will tell you what you could do, and your PI will tell you how you behave. Do I have that right? Pretty or close, yeah. Close? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 
wow, that's the saying I haven't used in a few years. Yeah. My resume will tell me what you can do. Mm-hmm. Your PI will tell me what you will do. Oh, that's right. What you will do. And it's right. <laughs> that really grabbed me when you, when you told me that for the first time. That's right. Wow. Now that is, that is super strong. I think also um, what I've come to tell people is that what PI did for my company in hiring people or taking on a franchisee, it didn't necessarily tell me whether they were the right franchisee or right employee but it told me if they were the wrong one, which that's kind of an unfair advantage that you have. I mean, such an edge. If you can just eliminate the people that are not going to be a right fit from a behavioral assessment, that's huge, isn't it? Yeah. It, and, uh, you know, and once again, this goes across all industries. Yeah, I, I'm a big believer in that, in that, you know, technically, you and I could probably do most jobs out there. You know, I'd like to think someone could train me to be, you know, a lab tech or whatever. But I would be a disaster on a thing like that. I, mean, I just would. So, yeah, if I can stop organisations, and particularly growing organisations, making one bad hire, we've, we've helped their business. And I think in small companies, that's even more critical. You know, I often joke about this. It's like, you know, we've got clients with 70,000 plus employees. Great. They make a bad hire. Mm-hmm. So what? But if you're a team of five and you make a bad hire. Oh, that's, that's devastating. Yeah. I mean, I... Yeah. Years back, I, I, I did a startup company doing medical supplies back in the UK many years back. And we you know, literally grew from me doing everything, you know, and team. And I got to the stage where I knew I needed an office manager. And this is before I'd met Predictive Index and made the mistake of hiring someone who came from a big company. You know, and we were small, very agile. Everyone did. You know, you did what you've got to do when you're a small growing business. And this lady said on day one, looked at me and said, well, well who does the filing? And I'm like, whoever's standing closest to the filing cabinet. <laughs> Including myself. Yeah, exactly. And she just wasn't a match. Right. On that. So, yeah, if I, if I can stop a particular growing company making one bad <laughs> hire, I'm, you know, my, my work here is done. Right. Let's, let's go back and talk about the origin of Predictive Index. I didn't know about this until recently when I knew you were going to be on the show. I was like, I got to learn about PI. I was fascinated. So I understand this goes all the way back to really World War II, 1942, a 26-year-old Arnold Daniels who volunteered for the U.S. Army Corps. Tell, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about, <laughs> about Arnold Daniels and what he did and why it was so fascinating and what he, what he created. Yeah, it's a really cool story. Um, as I say, you know, there's, there's so many assessments coming on the marketplace now, and we're, we're very much one of the old men of the, the industry on that. So, yeah, Arnold was shipped off to England, um, uh, and a lieutenant, and flew over 30 missions um, over Europe. And the commanders looked at his team record and were like, why are these guys successful and other people aren't? Mm-hmm. You know, they're all flying the same plane. They've all been through the same training. Why are his team smashing it? And, and no casualties either. No, his no, entire no, there was a casualty. I mean, just just every, every metric they were measured on, they were, they were they were blown out of the water. So they sat down and, and started to really analyse them. They brought in a psychologist to work with them, and that's really when Arnold was first introduced to psychometric testing, mm. and he fell in love with it and realised that this had implications way way beyond the military. You know, this was all about solving business problems. You know, coming back to that, you know, all all business problems are people problems. Well, it really is. So, you know, he went off to Boston. The military paid for him to go to Harvard. And in 1952, he released the very original predictive index assessment. You know, what we now call the behavioural assessment. And then in 55, he founded what was then PI Worldwide. Um, and, And now over the years, obviously, it's grown Hundreds of validity studies done across the globe. I think we're about 42 million plus behavioural assessments we've done now. So, yeah, you you know, (laughs) we've been around a bit. We've got some data to back us up on this, on that. So we've really grown into this global company. And it's it's wonderful. I was on a call yesterday, actually, with one of the the, the big um, predictive index partners over in Europe. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they were telling me, you know, once again, household names, IKEA, you know, companies you know worldwide across the globe, you use these tools because your people are your, are your really to your, so critical to your business. Right. Right. Yeah. I understand your, um, the use of PI goes way above and beyond franchising and there's, you know, professional sports teams and huge fortune 500 companies and 
I know we can't talk about them because of NDAs and that's fine, but I think it's fascinating that this goes far above and beyond, you know, franchising, of course, that people realize that this is a incredibly powerful tool that you don't have to go at it alone when it comes to, you know, hiring, recruiting, and uh, really uh, retaining people long-term. Yeah, I mean, retention at the moment is massive for organizations. Mm -hmm. You know, people want to hold on to their best people. Why wouldn't you on that? So pe people often ask us um, what kind of company uses you know, predictive index. Mm -hmm. And uh, my glib answer is always a company where the people are important. <laughs> and they look at you like, what? And I'm like, oh, but think about it. Right. It's true. You can have the most beautiful restaurant, but if the staff aren't any good, it's not going to work. You can have a, a gorgeous hotel, but it doesn't work. So I don't care what kind of organisation you are. The quality of your people are what differentiate you from the competition. Right. I, I had a, a lovely conversation with one of our clients recently, and they're a, they're a big beer distributor, and, and was sitting talking to their senior management team. And the CEO said to me, he said, look, the Heineken we sell is no different to the Heineken the other distributors sell. Mm -hmm. The difference is the quality of our people. It always comes down to people. Yep. I could never imagine hiring somebody. Um, even when I started doing the Emerging Franchise Brands podcast, and I needed to bring on a virtual assistant. I had candidates through Upwork come through and I made sure they filled out a PI. Like, why am I going to take a chance without having somebody do, you know, take the assessment tool? Let's find out what I'm getting myself involved with. I don't think there's a company that could be too small to use a tool. Like oh, this. no. And, and, and that smallest client, I think, is for employees. But once again, they, they appreciate it because they need to understand how to work together better. Yes. And especially as we grow, it just becomes increasingly more difficult. The challenge becomes enormous to keep that culture in place. Yeah. I, you know, when I was starting out and when I had four, five, six people, yeah, it's easy to add the seventh and eighth. But once you start getting over 10, 11, 12 people, you can easily have the fabric of the culture start being torn apart because of different personalities. And back to your point about having people that complement one another, you're not looking for all the same people. But you want to engage with people that are going to be a right fit culturally. And the bigger you get, the bigger challenge is going to be. Yeah, and your culture is is such a buzzword out there at the moment. But it's true. And, and you know, so someone once said to me, you know, your, your cult, you can have all the best things on your website going and mm -hmm. big signs in your entrance hall, but your culture is what you accept. Yes. I heard from uh, w one of these um, business coaches shared his definition of culture he says, culture is how we treat one another. Yeah, true on that. And so, you know, understanding each other better mm -hmm. helps with that culture. Because we're not all the same, and nor do we want to be. But understanding that this member of my team likes a lot more detail than, than is my natural style, <laughs> or, or likes to think things through and works at a slightly slower place than, than is my natural style, mm -hmm. just helps us interact better. For sure. So, you know, very, very powerful tool, particularly as you're building a team. Right. On that, because, to, yeah, to, you know, your point, once you start hitting sort of eight or nine plus employees, it starts to get tough. It gets dicey, yeah, for sure. You're going to make a mistake. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I I challenge all the time whenever I'm, I'm speaking, it's like, you know, anyone in this room made a bad hire, <laughs> you know, and, and, and the one person who has to put their hand up, I'm like, so you've never hired anyone, obviously. <laughs> we all make mistakes. And, and that's, that once again comes back to it. It's using data to take those personal biases out of the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I want you to share something um, that you talked about actually before we started recording the podcast, and that was about companies that are clients that go against what the science <laughs> tells them because they've got that gut feeling. My instinct tells me, Mike, I need to hire this person. How does that usually go? Yeah, it. We we joke internally. Um, Virtually every client has to go through this. <laughs> it's a rite of passage. Yeah, almost. You know, <laughs> we and we we sort of smile. Like you'll be there, you know, having coffee or having just on a Zoom meeting with them, chatting with them, and everything else. And then they'll go like, "Yeah, we hired this guy, and the, 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 his behavioural data showed us that he wasn't <laughs> a match, but we just really liked him. You know, and he interviewed great, and so we hired him. And I always go and and." what and they're like yeah we let him go last week um, like because yeah they are who they are sure and, and to your point you know the best of him showed up at the interview <laughs> but three weeks into it it was like the real him showed yeah. up on the afterwards yeah 
So let's talk about that fateful day when we first met. I think we met as a result of one of my top performing franchisees, Steve Cox in Columbus, Ohio, and suggested that we talk with you guys. And <laughs> why don't we share how that meeting went? We, we met in, uh, in a Starbucks. Yeah, that was a red flag for us straight away, actually. Um, Our building was under construction, so we couldn't meet in the office. So it was me, and, and I brought just a, a few members of my team. Now, we had done PI before our meeting, so you knew what you were going in with before you met us. And as I said to you, why wouldn't I do that? That's right. I mean, I, I constantly shout at my team over this, is we should never be having a conversation with anyone <laughs> without having their behavioral assessment in front of us. <laughs> and we talk about an unfair advantage. That is truly unfair because it's one-sided because I don't have your PI. Yeah, exactly. And we're not going to let you have it. <laughs> no. So, yeah, so we, the then founder of Predictive Results, um, Steve Waterhouse, who, who got me into predictive things in the first place. Um, and I was sat in this Starbucks, which was just around the corner from where I lived at the time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you walked with your team and everything and we all said hi and introduced. And... Uh, it, I'd like to claim it was me, but it wasn't. It was Steve. Was it Steve? Yeah. So I, I reached out. I shook shook Steve ha Steve's hand. I said, hi, my name is Frank Fumi. And his response was? You're unemployable. <laughs> and, and what was wonderful. He said hello. I don't think, no. he, I think his response was you're unemployable. Yeah. But there was his gasp <laughs> from your team. I remember your team all looking at each other going, who are these guys? <laughs> right, a bunch of clowns. Yeah. And even I was like... <laughs> <laughs> um, but you laugh because you 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 got it, and yeah, and it was true, you know, and and it was true. I am unemployable, <laughs> which is why you're an entrepreneur, right? And and I'm very much the same um, sort of thing. But yeah, and then Steve went in, then went on to to talk about you, you know, the fact that you are your natural style is you're very informal, you're flexible, you're certainly independent, you're assertive, you know, you're people orientated, you're outgoing, you know, you're restless, you're driving. But what does that mean that you need? Mm. Well, it means you need freedom from structure. You know, you like independence. You need to control your own activities. You like opportunities to interact and to influence. And you like variety and an opportunity to work at a fast and average pace. We knew that about you before you even walked in through that door. Mm. So that gave us a huge amount of power. So yeah, perfect entrepreneurial material. You know, you're not going to be happy are you sat in a cubicle doing spreadsheets. So, Interesting. I mean, just isn't it so understanding that about you was critical so which is why i knew steve could make that comment with well yeah basically you know you're never going to fit into the corporate world too it's just as well you started your own business but you know we knew that from the data we had in front of you but where it then becomes useful is helping you then build that team and and you know i've, I've had the pleasure of working with you and, and brian and everyone else for you know well, well over a decade now and um you know i'll credit you that and you might disagree with me on this, but I think the most sensible thing you ever did was hire Brian. There's no question about it. Because, no question about it. I agree with because you. Because he complements you. Mm -hmm. And and that's what I speak all the time when I'm speaking to franchisors or franchises or anyone trying to build a team, particularly startups, is number one, understand who you are. You know, so understand your very fast pace. You know, you're a big picture guy. You will drive the team. But then don't go out and hire another you. I have someone who, who brings to the table what you don't have. But you don't know that unless you can actually map that against the individual. So, you know, we we spend a lot of time helping organizations build, put together teams. And there's nothing more terrifying for me than and I, I had this just recently with a startup and I um, an IT company startup. And the entire management team were all the same. Oh, gosh. And it was terrifying because they're all patting themselves on the back going, aren't we great? And I'm going, actually, <laughs> no, slow down here. You know, you need some process. You need some precision. And you're, you're very innovative. You're very agile. You're, you're great at big picture stuff. Mm -hmm. And you're having 900 great ideas a day, but is anyone writing them down? <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah, it was a uh, – but that the, the story about Steve's very first words to you about being – Hi, you're unemployable. Um, oh it has, has gone down in legend somewhat amongst our team. Oh, it is. It, uh, yeah, I was taken back, but I, I certainly took it in good fun. And the truth is, it was right. <laughs> it was 100% <laughs> right. Here's another thing, though, that during that sh that small meeting we had, I think it was me and about 
three or four others from the company. And as you read one of the other members of my management team's PI, you then start talking about our relationship with one another. And if I recall, it was a lady who was in charge of the customer service center, a great gal, super smart, great leader. But what you said to me was, Frank, when you give her accolades publicly in a group, it embarrasses her. You picked up on that through the PI and she turned like 15 shades of red when you said that and she was shaking her head yes. And I would have never thought in a million years by me saying something great about her and giving her a compliment in a group meeting that it would embarrass her. Because we tend to see the world through our own eyes. Okay. So those of us who like the public accolades, well, surely everyone else likes the public accolades, but when we measure that extroversion drive, I talked about that need for social interaction. Mm -hmm. There are people who are low in that drive. There are people who are very comfortable being heads down on their own. There are people who are quite happy. You know, they love remote work. I mean, COVID has changed the world for all of us dramatically. But but we've seen particularly around that drive is, yeah, there are those people who say, you are now going to work from home. And they're like, yes, I never have to speak to anyone ever again. Mm -hmm. And that they're happy with that. And there's other people on the other end of that spectrum who that's terrifying for. So, yeah, you understanding or being told that about that individual. Because, yeah, mm -hmm. you would naturally want to give them praise how you like to receive praise. Right. But we're all different. But PI helps us understand that we're all different. So true. I, I want to take this time now to kind of shift gears a little bit and talk about your company, MVP Results, because you do more than predictive index. And what um, what's prompted this, uh, I think this next segment, is a conversation you and I had offline a few months ago over lunch when we were talking about what the result has been because of COVID and people working remotely. And you had some interesting data points on how productivity has been and how also maybe us Gen Xers and boomers are seeing the world differently. But would you share a little bit with the audience here? What, uh, what are some of your findings about this? Yeah, happy to. So our mission, our North Star very much, uh, and, and we steal this from Predictive Index, is better work, better world. Because, you know, if we can put people into jobs that they enjoy working on teams, that they enjoy working for bosses they like working for, mm -hmm. ev everything changes. The metrics for any business change on that. But as MVP results, we we have a, a, a saying, and people say, what do you guys do? And basically, we gather data, we deliver insights, so people can take action. So the Predictive Index suite of tools are wonderful, and say, so, you know, we're an elite partner, very proud to be an elite partner, we're one of the, the, the biggest Predictive Index partners on the globe. And it's, they're not the only suite of tools we use. Um, we do a lot of work around emotional intelligence which is being seen as critical of that. And there's certainly studies out there that are saying it's probably n number one predictor of, of job success, particularly amongst management levels mm. on that. So an emotional intelligence is, is huge. And then we, hold, we run a whole range of 360s and various leadership tools out there. So any, any time we sit down with any organisation, it's about gathering data. Because as I said to you right at the beginning, they'll have data on their metrics. You know, they'll, know when the, they'll know when this truck needs servicing. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have any data on it, the people sitting in the organisation. So we, 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 we gather that data, which enables us to deliver those insights so that we can then take action. And, yeah, we had lunch a, a little while back and, and, and talked about COVID. Now, you know, let's be honest, none of us were prepared for COVID. I don't care. Right. You know, even an old grey guy like me, we, you know, we, we've lived through a lot. Um, but there isn't a management school or a book anywhere that taught any of us how to deal with that. So mm -hmm. we all did a little bit of sort of pants. And there's certainly a generational thing around this as well. We're seeing a lot at the moment of of particularly, and I hate to say it, my generation of, of leaders wanted everyone back into the office. And it's causing problems because not everyone wants to go back into the office. And, and I'll give you a real world example about this, and, and I'll, I'm going to get into trouble when I get home over this. Um, but you know, my, my wife is a good example of this. So, you know, obviously I have her behavior assessment. Why would I want to understand? Of course. What she is. Who was? Um, <laughs> you know, what makes my wife tick? And, and she's low in that extroversion drive, that drive for social interaction. So before COVID, she went into the office each day. And she's very much a, a very analytical heads down. I'm working that. And, and, 
you know, I just know from her style, she gets frustrated when getting interrupted. So working in the office for her was hard work. You know, someone would always be sticking their head into her office door. Hey, what are we doing about this? You know, or, hey, come on, we all need to go down to the restroom. It's Sally's birthday. Let's go and sing happy birthday to Sally. And, and then COVID hit and she got to work from home. She's 10 times more productive working from home. Mm. And, and, and in fact, has changed change jobs so she doesn't have to ever go back into the office again she's 100 percent remote and and thrives on that our generation of managers too often want people to come back in but i'll always challenge them on that because if it's well if you don't trust your people to work why did you hire them in the first place mm. but more importantly as well we're seeing more and more data and it's we're still early into this so i'm sure this will change over time but the data we're certainly seeing is people on the whole are more productive from home. And I, I know of a very large financial organisation and I'm friends with one of their VPs, which is what, so I won't mention them because I don't want to get them into trouble. Um, but they're actually seen round about when people were coming into the office, they were logged on for about 38, 39 hours a week. Their entire workforce is now fully remote. And they're logging on for about 48 to 49 hours a week now. Really? And I've seen this with my own wife. Huh. Because where it was before, hair, makeup, business suit on, an hour commute into the office, mm-hmm. and then an hour commute home. You're chewing up all the time. Yeah. She, yeah. So she wasted two hours of every day, then 10 hours a week, mm-hmm. sat in the car. She doesn't now. I mean, she was on a Zoom meeting at 8 a.m. this morning. Where before she would have been sitting in the car in traffic. And we all know what traffic's like in the temper area. So, <laughs> so yeah, I think, I think we as leaders have to adapt and understand that, you know, the world is changing and what different generations want from their world is changing as well. I think that was part of the conversation we had around that, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, because during the conversation, you said something that really struck me. And, and that was, it doesn't really matter what you or I think the next generation of leaders believe in working from home. They believe in working remote. When you look at the millennial, you look at the Gen Z generation, to them, it's no, it's going to be normal. Almost like you said, like, we were the problem. Is that? Yeah, and I, I think it is. Um, and and w- also what people want. Um, we're from a, gen- well, certainly, I only speak for myself here, you know, a generation where it was all about achieving the corner office and right. becoming the CEO and all the symbols of power, whatever you want to call it. Different generations don't see it that way. I mean, having meaning to their work and understanding the why behind their work is critical to them and work-life balance is becoming more critical to them and, and fair play to them. Mm-hmm. You know, I, you know I, our generation, I think, yeah, was, was all about doing 80-hour work weeks. People don't want to do that anymore and, and I support them, you know. Right. Why shouldn't they? So, yeah, I think I think work is going to change dramatically over the coming years. Um, technology has made that easier as well, don't forget. With Zoom, of course. Yeah, I mean, we, gosh, I started out in sales a thousand years ago. And, you know, <laughs> I've always been a salesman at heart. And, and I was a road warrior. Mm-hmm. And that's that's what I did. You know, I was, I was on the road from Sunday night till Friday night every week. Mm-hmm. We've grown MVP results into, into a, a huge organisation that I'm very proud of, for me sitting behind a camera. And most of my team, you know, we very rarely go out and, and interact face-to-face face to face on that. You know, and, and, and for me, that was a big learning curve. Sure, that was not weren't familiar with doing that. You you were always face-to-face and always doing the road warrior thing. So let's tie this together from the earlier conversation about culture. How do I create, how do I continue to build a team and keep a great culture when I have my staff all working remote? What do I need to do that's different? It is a tough one. It is a tough one. And, and once again, I, I advise a lot of our clients around this, be aware of those different behavioral styles. So once again, I'm bringing it back to, to, to PI. Uh, that, that, that understanding that the, my my people who are low in that extroversion who are quite happy working from home are fine. They're quite happy to communicate via a, an email like that, or a text or whatever. But you will have team members who do need that those huddles and, and, and probably miss the collaboration on that. So, you know, use the technology that's out there. I, I made a big point 
during COVID of making sure that my team members who are high in that need for social interaction, that I connected with them. And I made sure I connected with them on camera. And, and we talked and, and just, hey, how's it going? You know, what's it like homeschooling the kids? You know, The things that we would talk about when someone would walk past my office, yeah, because that is probably the big fear of people that have a staff working remote, is that I don't get the drop by in my office and we talk about, you know, I don't know how the lightning played last night or what's going on with the bucks this Sunday and, you know, how, how are the kids, how's the dog, you know, how's the spouse, all those things were in the drop by conversations. That's how we kind of built rapport. And how do we do that? So I guess the answer is a dedicated time on zoom. Where we're just, we're, we're talking about those same things. We're just not saying I need to have a zoom call at nine 30 tomorrow morning to discuss this sales, you know, meeting. Yeah, it, it, we can't take the humanity out of this. We really can't. Maybe because so. we didn't know what we were doing after COVID. You know, during COVID, we have this this uh, video. We have this Zoom thing. We don't even know how to use it. Like, we're a bunch of cavemen, right? Yeah. Oh, definitely. <laughs> so we're using it exactly as mechanically as you could imagine. Just, okay, we're going to have a meeting. We're going to talk about these things from top to bottom. But we forgot about the relationship. Yeah, and and you know, we have team meetings and, and we insist everyone's on camera and, you know, unless there's something going on. And what I've really enjoyed about this is we still managed to get to know people. I mean, we've taken on associates within MVP results who I've never physically met. But we encourage people to be human. So I love the fact that people's cats are wandering across screens right. you know, and the dog's barking because the GPS guy's turned up. I, I had a lovely conversation with one of our clients recently and her daughter attends all of our meetings. Her three-year-old daughter sits on her lap and attends all of our meetings. And it's wonderful. And I was like, hi. And uh-huh. Yeah, we, we can't take the humanity out of this. Yeah. We've, we, I think, yeah, we, we need to make sure that we use technology to aid us, not let technology rule us. Right. You know, I've had Savannah as my virtual assistant only since June. And I would tell you that I feel like I've known her for years and, and Anthony, the producer, I've known him for a little bit less amount of time. But the thing is, we know about each other. And while, of course, I see Anthony when I come here and record the, the podcast, Savannah, I've never met. She lives in California 3,000 miles away. Yet I know all about her family. I know about her dog, Bosco. And, you know, he's a tiny terror. <laughs> And she knows about Dylan, my chocolate lab. And we, we just, we talk about, you know, talk about my kids and what's going on, you know, uh, just with family life. And I think we've proven through our relationship that we could be 3,000 miles away. Yet I feel like I've gained as much rapport with her as I ever have with anybody that I saw every day in my office. Perfect. Yeah. And I, I think we have to be very aware of that. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's super key. All right, so let's uh, let's have a little bit of fun here now. So you already told me what my PI says about me, and our producer Anthony has also taken his taken a PI. He's smiling there behind the camera. What does the PI say about Anthony? <laughs> it tells me I'm surprised he puts up with you, but it's another story altogether, Frank. Oh, we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to that part. Yeah, Anthony's very detail orientated and calm and methodical and likes to take his time and make sure things are done correctly he's not going to be up in your face he's going to be a little bit quieter collaborative you know talk, let's 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 think about this but yeah good with details very patient far more patient than than either of us will ever be and but calm methodical process orientated i think he was a little hesitant not maybe to take PI, but he didn't seem like he was going to be a believer. I think, Anthony, you texted me. You're like, I don't know. I took this thing, but I don't know how two questions are going to explain me. I was, yeah, I was I was a skeptic for sure because it was literally just two questions and it was just a bunch of, you know, the words on the screen that I get to pick. And somehow you you were able to pretty much pinpoint my my personality from that. I was I was pretty surprised. Yeah, don't worry. We, we get that all the time. I've been accused of... I had a lady once asked if I, I, I'd interviewed her children when she read her results. So she's like, how do you know this stuff about me? And I'm like, well, there's, there's nearly 70 years of solid science backing this up. This is, this is not, you know, something new we just made up. Let's talk about this new feature with Predictive Index. 
which I think is incredibly powerful. This wasn't something that I had available to me 10 years ago, but the feature that allows, um, that looks the relationship between two people in an organization. So when you overlay my PI and Anthony's, what does it say? <laughs> so yeah, predictive index software has developed tremendously over the years and, and, and I will give huge credit to the, the parent company up in Boston they've invested a lot of money to make the software very very user friendly and brought in a lot of new features and, and yeah you talk about the one to one relationship guide mm-hmm. and basically what it does it looks at two people it looks at their strengths where they're going to complement each other but the fun part is always the proportions you know <laughs> where we you not see this so um, while we were getting ready to do this I let Anthony just just have, have a quick quick read of this the relationship between because you're you're very fast paced your big picture your let's go for it typical entrepreneur and i know you know you can hear this on every podcast i'm sure we, we're entrepreneurs we we leap off the cliff and mm-hmm. we build the plane as, as we i think crash towards the pretty cliff. much every episode that has come up yeah. or nearly every yeah. episode yeah. is true yeah and it's what we do and you know and, and as an entrepreneur myself I, I i get that and we need people like anthony actually in our life god do we ever because they're going to go, whoa, slow down. Why don't we actually draw out a plan for the plane before we jump off the cliff? Right. So I let Anthony read through this relationship guide where we literally compare two people to see how they're going to work together. And he just started laughing. And I said, what? And he read this. And I'll, I'll, I'll read it verbatim. You know, Anthony may feel like Frank communicates without getting to the point, whereas Frank may feel like Anthony is too focused on the details. <laughs> and neither's right nor wrong. Right, you know that that to me is the the, the power of PI. Is, is this isn't a judgment call. This isn't saying I'm right, you're wrong. It's saying we see the world differently. How can we then complement each other and work together on that? And 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 it gives relationship tips around this. You know, Anthony should make sure that you're clear on specific action items and next steps when they're in conversations. Because you and I are just like yeah, 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 off we charge and right. don't do what he's asked us to do. Well, that explains why he got so excited when. We implemented a new process that at the end of the at the end of our episode, I immediately walk over to the laptop and I go onto the calendar and I plot when the episode is going to be released. And he just had this like sense of relief, like finally we're going to do something like you know tangible in detail, some structure, some structure around it, and that gave you like a huge sense of relief because there was a point where Mike, we had like a bunch of episodes recorded already we've been doing this since july but we didn't we didn't plot them on any dates yet and i could tell anthony was getting a little freaked out because he has to do a lot of work behind the scenes were you not yes yes sir and you're like hey if you could do that on you know monday that would be really helpful and i'm thinking what's the big deal like all right fine we're gonna get to it but he was like overcome with relief once i plotted them on the calendar that just gives you like a little taste into our world yeah and and that's that's the beauty of the relationship guide is is helping you understand what they need and, and as leaders you know the the worst thing i've ever heard is the golden rule you know hey let's treat other people how i like to be treated well mm. that's fine if they're the same as you right but, but right. you and anthony are very different so you treating him how you like to be treated would drive him insane so we talk about the platinum rule is why not treat people how they like to be treated yes the great thing about that relationship guide it it, it works at all levels you know it isn't just necessary a leader talking to one of his team it's co-workers it it works at all levels i had a a lovely conversation with a client the other week um who, who's fairly new to predictive index and and this, this lady had been through the workshop and been trained in it and so really understood it and was wildly enthusiastic about it she called me up she went i love this and i was like you know tell me more she's like every time i'm in a meeting and two people start butting heads i bring up their behavioral assessments and i'm like huh uh-huh uh-huh because you can immediately see where the friction is right i was in one <laughs> i'm laughing because it was a few months back i walked into my old company's office building and they have the placards they're eight and a half by 11 placards of your actual pi graph and they have it taped to everybody's cubicle yeah. outside so you can almost see what you're walking into yeah no <laughs> and that's great and i love that and we've got a lot of clients do that i mean it's it's to us, it's a best practice. Is why wouldn't you want to understand? As I'm about to walk into Jeff's office, that Jeff's all about detail. Mm-hmm. You know, Jeff wants detail. Or I'm going to walk into Lizzie's office, and Lizzie's like us, big picture. You know, hey, yeah, just give me the headlines. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm 
I tend to be that. There's a, there's a running joke within our organisation that um, I've never read a fourth bullet point. That if you can't tell me what you need to tell me in three, then really, you know, go away, think about it again. Right. Um, because, yeah, I don't have huge patience. You know, I'm very fast moving. I, I, let's get let's cut to the chase here. I don't want a lot of That's flat. so funny. On that. That, but, but the lovely thing is my team understand that. And even some of my clients understand it. And I actually had an email once from a client. Right. And we were talking about a project we were going to do together. And there was three bullet points. And then they put, see, no fourth bullet point. And I thought... <laughs> Right. We work to get, but we work together so much better now. Right. Right. <laughs> Let's talk about does PI change? Does your PI ever um, change? And at what age is it is it set? Yeah. So once again, re- referring to the wonderful predictive index science team here, mm-hmm. um, because they're the clever people that do all this. So I'm not going to get into nature versus nurture because okay. I think our psychologists themselves can't can't agree on this. But really, sort of by your late teens, you know. Your your behaviour will be set. How you present to the outside world will change. But the scientists tell us, and they have a huge amount of data to back this up, you know, as I said to you, you know, we've done 42 million plus of these assessments, so mm-hmm. it's not like we don't have data to back this up. That who you are does not dramatically change over time. So I was a very competitive, very fast-paced, very annoying 18-year-old, and I'm very competitive, very fast-paced, mm-hmm. considerably older than 18. You know, so... Who you are tends to be set in stone. You know, those drives, that that need to want to take control of things, or that need to always want to talk things out with people, or that need to move fast, or that need for, I like, process and precision, is set really as you enter out of So and about then, your late teens? Yeah, late teens tends to be, you know, and it doesn't it doesn't dramatically change over time. And it, it's always nice to us that you know, sometimes we're out and we're running workshops or we're out visiting a client or you know, talking to a client on Zoom, and someone will say, yeah, I, yeah, I took it 30 years ago and then I took it three weeks ago and, yeah, I am who I am. Mm-hmm. Now, we do measure some other things such as how you adapt to your environment. Yes. Because that does change. And I noticed that. So when I took my first one 12 years ago, you know, I had the results. And so I was excited to retake it because I'm thinking I'm a totally different person than I was 12 years ago. And it turned out it was exactly the same. However, um, I should probably step back and say, let the audience know there's there's really there's three different graphs, right? Correct. So explain what each three are because my second one, my one in the middle, did change quite dramatically. Yeah. The, so, yeah, we measured three things. So, self is is who you naturally are, and as I said, that the, the scientists are, are adamant that, that unless there's major trauma, you know, mm-hmm. and we won't go into that, but. You know, you are who you are by the time you reach those late teens, and that's not going to change. And time. mine did not change at all. It no. was almost, it was virtually identical. Yeah, and, and that's one of the reasons, actually, that, that makes us a legally valid pre-hire assessment mm-hmm. is you know, that tends to be stable on that. But the second thing we measure is the thing we call self-concepts, and that's how you adapt to your environment. That's going to change depending on, on what's going on in the world. So... You know, my mine is 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 I I I try to be less assertive, less dominant, more of a team player. Now I, it says CEO on my title, but you know I'm part of a team, so you know I try very hard to 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 rein that natural need to take control of everything, pull that back in. So the PI on that second graph shows that you're trying to like you know you kind of really need to reel it in. Yeah. And so when I'm reading your PI, I'm like, oh, I can see Mike really thinks he needs to maybe be maybe a little more formal, have more processes, can't yeah, be as yeah. flexible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Try to try to be more collaborative. Um, try okay. to try try to listen a little bit more. And and yeah, my 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 need to get everything done yesterday. I I try to work on that. Mm. No, I'm not going to tell you I succeed, <laughs> but I do try. So yeah, the, your self concept will change depending upon what's going on. Okay, so for example, uh, before I did this podcast, or myself, is it self concept? Is that yeah, the the first yeah. one? No, the first one is yourself. That's okay. who you naturally are, and that doesn't change. So myself, the extroverted uh, part of the graph, it wasn't incredibly high, but the self concept was much higher, and it, that explains why somebody like me would feel like. I'm doing a podcast, I have an audience, I'm on social channels now, I need to be more outgoing, ex- extroverted, yeah. I need to be more outgoing. Yeah, yeah. So we, we measure who, who you 
you know, your natural self. We, we measure how you're adapting to your environment. And then the third one really is is the mix of the two. The synthesis, right? Yeah, so so yeah, it's called the synthesis because it literally is. So it's, you know, this is who I naturally am. This is how I'm trying to modify that because of the work I want to get done. Mm-hmm. And so that's what you tend to see in many ways. And as a client of PI, though, even if I didn't want to understand the graphs, there's a, just a narrative that I could read as an employer, right? Why don't we talk about that? Yeah, as I said, the, 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 the software's come on leaps and bounds. So, you know, when, when Arnold Daniels created this tool many, many years ago, you know, back in, back in the 50s, um, this was all done on pen and paper. And there are still, the, you know, you still see them from time to time on that. But PI has invested heavily in the software. So it's now a very, very user-friendly tool that, that someone takes that behavior assessment on average, six minutes, but it's not time. It just takes as long as, as little time as you want. We just know globally it takes around about six minutes on that. And then the software does all the magic. So you literally can click on a button. It will produce a, a quick report. So, you know, I, you know I, I have the one here on you, Frank, you know, and it just says, you know, you know it tells us that you're going to be very informal. You're going to need freedom from structure, you know. It's and I'll read this verbatim for you. You know, at work, your colleagues may perceive you as someone who is naturally risk taking, daring, and focused on future goals. You're more concerned with where you're going than how you will get there or where you've been. I think that's pretty, pretty adaptable, accurate. Adaptable, operates flexibly, makes decisions and takes action, even with little proof concerning their decision, confident in their own ideas, and unimpressed with tradition. A person, take me out of this, a person with these these behaviors, would you be surprised that this person would be feeling uncomfortable being part of a growing franchise that has grown to hundreds of franchisees, franchise advisory council needing to get buy-in, a company where there's a lot more processes where you just can't turn on a dime and say, we're going to, I have the strategy. Can you see why this person might feel like, I think it's time for me to move on. Definitely. And it, we you know we work with a lot of franchisors mm-hmm. and, and franchisees, and it's very often you know I know this is the emerging franchise podcast yeah but we 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 see this time and time again particularly on franchi- franchisors your first ten maybe franchisees are going to be pretty entrepreneurial because they're going to help you build that with you and 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 by the nature you know if you're jumping into a new franchisee you've got to be pretty sorry, a new franchise, you've got to mm-hmm. be fairly comfortable with, with risk on that. So you're going to be that entrepreneurial spirit. But as it grows and you get to 50 or 100 and this process, your franchisee is going to probably need to be a different character because the the the, the entrepreneurial maverick who, hey, I'll make this up as I go along rules, I don't need no stinking rules, isn't going to fit well into that system. You're actually going to want people who are more comfortable with process. So we see the franchisee model when we change as as franchise or franchises really sort of evolve over time. So yeah, you're that that loving the leaping off the, the cliff and building the plane going on the way down works great for a startup and as you grow in a franchise. But once you get to that hundred plus and maybe it's process and and discipline, you know, I I, I went through this in an early stage of my career. I would, um I was part of an organization, a, a management team. We took a tiny company and grew it into a multi-million dollar brand um, and, and then were floated on the stock exchange, which was wonderful for money, don't get me wrong. Mm. But we were then owned by insurance companies and merchant banks and they wanted process, 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 process. And whereas before we were this group of happy entrepreneurs who were running around making these up as we went along. I was expected to be at my desk and answering to the share price day in day out. Mm-hmm. And I did not fit into that model at all. That wasn't me on that. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I exited because it, it just wasn't me. So, yeah, understanding, you know, where your franchise is in its journey can be important because, yeah, your franchisees at the start will probably look very different to what they look like when you reach number 100. For sure. So you want to use predictive index when you're a brand new franchise or in other words, it's never too early because you really do want to know what that behavioral assessment is of those incoming franchisees. And we know that it's super hard to turn down that first franchise fee. Yeah, definitely. But 
coming back to what we said right at the beginning, mm-hmm. if we could stop you making that one bad decision, right? You've done that, and and also as you build your team out, you know your own internal team, understanding first who you are, and then bringing in people who can plug into those areas that are your blind spots. Yes, and there's not necessarily wrong people, but there is peop- wrong people for the size of your company. So I loved my team starting out. But some of the characters in the, on the team weren't the best folks to be able to support a 100-unit franchise chain. It was just a completely different organization. So I think you also have to match your staff for where you are, knowing that just inherently you're going to grow, people are going to leave, and at the same time you don't want to hire somebody that would be really good managing a 500 unit franchise chain from the very beginning because they would be they'll be frustrated with me yeah. by not operating in a way that they would expect right yeah exactly. it works both ways yeah oh definitely yeah no it, it understanding where you are um is, is critical and that's one of the things we spend a lot of time as a, as a predictive index partner mm-hmm. it, it, is working with clients to understand that you know let's map this let's let's look at what is your culture you know are you a very fast-paced organization in which case people like you and i are going to excel because we're going to enjoy it other people like anthony you know who prefer a more steady pace would probably get burnt out mm-hmm. and, or you know get frustrated with this but, right so you know just understanding what your culture is and then plugging people into that who are going to excel in that culture as opposed to go this might not be for me right so in anthony's case he needs the structure, yet he probably likes the variety of flexibility because it's all within a framework. I'm not coloring too far out the lines that's going to freak him out. But at the same time, he and I get to do new podcasts every week. We're all, we're introducing something new. It's exciting, and but it's it's within his in his lane, right? Yeah, and 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 he can control the details, which is fine for you and I because we don't want to. I mean. He has a superb setup here. It is great. The, the first thing he said to me on our on our first phone call, he said to me, Frank, you just need to show up. You said to me, Anthony, you said, I'm your co-pilot. You just need to show up. You do your thing and leave, and I got the rest from here. I mean, was he not speaking my language, Mike? Yeah, perfect. <laughs> it? And he didn't even have my PI. <laughs> Uh, what tell me about the training? If I'm a fr- as a franchisor, do I need to be trained, and or uh, what type of training is provided as, as for a client? So as I said, the you know, the software is 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 wonderful. It mm-hmm. really is, and 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 has progressed massively from from when you first started um, using Predictive Index on that. But we know that those clients who do an even a deeper dive um, and 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 really get trained in this, and so we run a whole range of different workshops. Now there's a lot of online learning we have now, uh, which is proved very good. Um, but but we run a variety of workshops depending upon what clients need to help them really become experts in this on that because the more you can understand about the nuances of this because you know on the surface level it sounds very simple but there are a lot of nuances to this um the better so you know as as a, a predictive index elite partner our, our job is to is to ensure you're getting the maximum return on your investment that you're, you're using the software in a way that, that really benefits your organization and then say yeah we, we run a whole range of different workshops on that i mean i I trained you and brian Mm -hmm. gosh more years ago than we care to remember oh yeah way back 2013 i'm thinking yeah possibly yeah it could could have been but uh so yeah there's huge support from us um we like to joke with the anti-consultants at mvp results (laughs) because because coming back to you know what i talk about is is we want you to be able to do this yourself I, I don't agree with business models where every time you need to do anything, you've got to call up a consultant or, hey, what do I do about this, 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 this. Right. So we really want to teach you to gather that data, to deliver those insights and be able to take action. You know, we're obviously there to hold your hands, but we've had clients who've been with us for decades and you know, most of their senior people have all been through these workshops and understand how to use this. It's super easy. And it really is super easy to learn. And, and to me, I love the clients because they're virtually self-sufficient. Now, every now and then, you know, they'll call us up and, hey, you know, hey, come in. But we don't want them having to refer to us every day. So, you know, yeah, we joke with the anti-consultants, but mm-hmm. you know, I, I want our clients to be able to stand on their own two feet. Now, we're always there to advise, we're always there to hold hands, but I want you to do this. So, you know, I love the fact, you know, I, I spoke to a client recently 
And he said, oh, no, I, I log into the software on a Sunday night. You know, I know I've got a team meeting Monday morning and just make sure I've got everyone's mm -hmm. behavioural assessment in front of me and know what I need to do. You know, why, why does he need to speak to me to do that? So, we, you know, we want you to be able to be self-sufficient as a client. Sure, and we, we want something that's so easy that we don't need to have to rely on you for every single candidate that comes through. Although I, I recall early on, I would say, Mike, here's what I see in this assessment. What do you think? And you would say, Frank, spot on. You got it. This is exactly what I'm seeing. And it just kind of reassured me and kind of gave me the confidence that I was seeing what I thought I was seeing. And this is before the great narrative came out because now with the, the narrative description yeah. that PI provides, it, it kind of eliminates you re needing to read the graph. Yeah, but we... We'd like to hold hands, particularly when clients are new. You know, mm -hmm. we, we work very the first ninety days of a client. We, you know, we we are we are in touch with them almost on a daily basis. And we're there. We have some clients who say, you know, contact us every week. We have other clients who we don't hear from. You know, we have to call them. Like, everything okay? They're like, yeah, we're great. We'll call you if we need you. Okay. So, Mike, if somebody is interested in working with MVP results and learning more about Predictive Index, how can they get a hold of you? Easiest way is our website, MVP dash results.com um, you can see myself and all my lovely team on there you can contact us on that and something that we do for not just franchisees franchisors or any business um, we do that is is we like you to try this out so something we we do with 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 anyone who's interested in the predictive index is is we're happy to sit there and, and analyze a job you're hiring for or a need you have or well, very often, particularly with smaller companies, is we'll come in for free and look at your leadership team um, and actually do a session with you to help you understand each other, understand where you work well together, understand where you butt heads. And mm -hmm. Frank, we talked about, you know, <laughs> that went on with your team. So yes, mvp-results.com and uh, visit our website and uh, we'd love to be able to talk to you. That's great. So your company like we talked about earlier, goes really way above and beyond franchising. Franchisors is just a, a snippet of the business that you guys do. But since most of the audience is involved in franchising, I always finish up with, I call it the tip jar. And it's because the franchise community is so generous with providing information. And this can be something even beyond franchising for you. What's a piece of advice you would give to maybe a, an entrepreneur that's starting out looking to franchise their concept as it relates to PI? Yeah, great question. Um, it, it comes down to understanding yourself and then understanding who you are, but more importantly, I think, understanding who you are not. And and I'll, I'll use you as, as the perfect example for that. You know, you, you're great at the big picture, but I think I9 really took off when you brought Brian on board. Absolutely. On that. So the, the one piece of advice I would give to anyone starting out on that is, yeah, be comfortable in who you are and, and be honest enough to admit that this isn't my strong point. You know, I'm not a process guy. So I knew I needed to bring in people who were good and who would slow me down at times and go, well, 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 well let's think this through. Yeah, you're probably right on that. So don't be afraid to admit your own weaknesses and then bring in people who complement that. Mike, that is fantastic advice. I am looking forward to releasing this episode because I think there, this will help so many franchisors and potential franchisees that are looking at a concept to know how this can relate to um, the right concept for them, whether it's the right culture. Hopefully every franchisor starts using PI. Hope so, Frank. Thanks again, Mike. I appreciate it. No, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yep. All right. Be well. Thank you for tuning into the Emerging Franchise Brands Podcast. For additional insights, guest applications, and to stay connected, visit us at efbpodcast.com. The Emerging Franchise Brands Podcast is for entertainment purposes only, and the views expressed do not necessarily represent those of Emerging Franchise Brands, its host Frank Fumi, or Emerging Franchise Group, LLC. Any discussed franchise or investment opportunity requires thorough investigation, obtaining proper disclosure documents, and expert consultation before making any investment decisions. The podcast and its host do not offer professional advice or endorsements, and they hold no responsibility for actions, representations, accuracy, or consequential damages related to the podcast content.